Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come into your presence. Thank you that we can worship you. Thank you that we can know you as our Father. Thank you that you love us intensely. And Lord, this morning we pray that the Holy Spirit would lead us to open the Word, to give us understanding and insight, and help us to be doers of your Word because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last time I was with you, we were in Acts chapter 11. At, uh, we looked at the church in Antioch. And uh, I'm actually going to skip chapter 12. I'll come back to it. And we're going to jump straight into Acts 13. And we looked at three aspects of the church last time and we said the church in Antioch as we saw it was a laboring church. They worked hard. They went from Jerusalem to Antioch and they, you know, they really worked hard uh, to become a church. They were a learning church. They went and fetched Paul from Tarsus and he came and uh, he spent time teaching them. And then we saw he, they were a loving church because they sent gifts back to the church in Jerusalem when they were facing hardship. And so today we're going to carry on now, but in Acts 13. And again, as I said last time, and I'll just repeat it again, we, we see that this whole book of Acts is a, is a pivot between the Gospels, the words of Jesus, and then the writings of Paul and other writers as they write the, the letters uh, to the different churches. And then, of course, as John ends up in Revelations. And so today I'm going to be talking about two more words. And the first one is a leading church. The church in Antioch was a leading church. Let us turn in our Bibles to Acts 13, and I'm going to read from verse 1. In the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And we'll only read that far uh, in that place. But what's interesting is the gathering of different people in this first description of the church in Antioch. All those different people that are gathered there, and uh, as we look at them, we see Barnabas. Now, we've met Barnabas before, and he really is the son of encouragement. He comes to bring encouragement to the church. And of course, he's the one that goes off to fetch Paul and bring him back so that Paul, with his skill and his knowledge, could be training and teaching the church in Antioch. And so he's the encourager. In Acts chapter 4, um, interesting to note this, in Acts 4 verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, it's the same person, which means a son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And so right here at the very beginning, there is Paul, uh, Barnabas, this, this man uh, from Cyprus, and he comes as a son of encouragement. The next one is, is Niger. And... Uh, they claim he was a black man, and uh, some think he was Simon from Cyrene. That, that is just claims. We can't verify that, of course. And, uh, of course, Simon of Cyrene, the man who carried the cross of Jesus. And then Lucius, Manan, and Saul. And we see a few of them here all together. We see people from, from Cyprus, from the Romans. We see the Gentiles. 
even former Pharisees and the church persecutor himself, Paul. So God paints this incredible, uh, beautiful tapestry of people in the church. And, uh, you know, these, this whole church is about diversity. Something that we struggle with. You know, I come, I've been to many churches, and they're so monoculture that it's actually quite frightening. I often um, go across to Ealing Broadway, sometimes across here in Ilford, and I've been across to another church uh, out in um, the far west of London. And, uh, you know, very, very strongly buxing churches. And, uh, you know, because I use a lot of Telugu, you don't find many other cultures that attend. Nothing wrong with that. But it excludes people. And uh, I've been to other churches, African, ba African churches, and the same again. They're so strongly African, there aren't any other cultures present. But as I look at you today, I go, this is the church that God wants. He wants a multicultural church of diversity. Because that was his intent right from the very beginning in Acts. God set the pattern. That's what he wants his church to look like. He doesn't want us to be monocultural. Because when we are of different nations, languages, and let me just quickly correct something that I said last time. I said more than 50% of the people from London uh, do not speak English, uh, and I should have said as their mother tongue. All right. Most of us do speak English. So let me just make that little correction before I get shot by somebody for what I said. <laughs> and so here is this multicultural church. And God is at work. God has a plan and a purpose in doing this because he wants his church to learn how they will live together, guess where? In eternity. That's where we are going to be the most diverse, uh, incredible bride of Christ, you know, from every nation. Revelation tells us, from every nation, we'll be gathered together at that great throne celebration. And so you see that these men that were together, they were not just... Uh, let's call it sitting there, sitting back, thinking, well, you know, we, we're the leaders. They were busy people. They were busy people. You know, so often we see God calls busy people. When we're sitting there on our haunches expecting a call or step into ministry, it's not going to happen. God says to you, get on with it. The things that you have at your hands, get on with it. Just move. Move with the Spirit. You know, let's move forward. And God starts then to add to you all the things that He wants you to do. And so, you know, these were not people in control. These were not people that were giving orders. They were worshipping, fasting, and praying. And that's really... If we think of the elders, that's where they should be. That's where they should be, on their knees, worshipping, praying, and fasting. And so a question I have is to ask ourselves, where do we fit in into this little picture of the church in Antioch? Do you... And like me, in the past, harbor those feelings of, you know what? I can do better than that. I am better than that. I speak a better language. I'm of a better race. Don't you find that? And you know, the city of London, the United Kingdom, 
You are no different to the rest of the world. Wherever you go, it is the same. Prejudice is everywhere. Now, I, as I stand before you here this morning, I may appear to be European, but I'm not. My parents, my forefathers, and all those before me for 400 years lived and worked in Africa. My grandparents suffered the most degrading, humiliating discrimination. My mother tongue is Afrikaans, which is the common language of people in, Southern Af in South Africa. Now, my grandmother was deaf. All, the, all her siblings were totally deaf. Because as young little kids, they were rounded up from the farms. And they were gathered together in concentration camps where they had to live. Because they spoke Afrikaans. That was during the Boer War. And because Lord Kitchener was suffering great loss from the British, uh, sorry, from the, uh, the Boer army that were attacking the British, he decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put all these women and children in camps so they can no longer help these, you know, let's call them raiders. Because that's what they were doing. They would attack the British and disappear. They would attack the British and disappear. And so it went on. And so he decided, I'm going to lock them all up. And so they were locked up. The women and the children were put into concentration camps because they spoke Afrikaans. After the Boer, Boer War was finished and they had, they, had, they had accessed certain parts of the country. The young children were taken. And if they were in school, and if they said one word of Afrikaans, one word, they were taken, put on a chair in the corner, they were made to stand on that chair, and they had to put a label around them called Donkey. You see, every nation has suffered wrongs and injustices. It's everywhere. So what do we do? What do we do when we're faced with these injustices? Well, let's have a look at what happened here in this church in Antioch. Because they set a model for us. You know, the first thing that they did is they found common ground. They found common ground. In other words, they found, what do we agree with? Let's focus on what we agree with. Let's stop focusing on our differences. Because that's what we do when we're faced with discrimination. People focus on our differences. And they say, you can't do this because you're from that race or that culture or that language. And they judge you before you've even had an opportunity to show who you are as a person. So we, like in this church, should focus on what is common among us. Look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. It says this, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And so Paul tells us there, you know, be willing to mingle and mix with the low in society. Those that society rejects. We've got to mingle with them. Every Sunday when I come here, 
and I turn off the uh, north circular onto this main road over here to come to the church. There's a tram. And he's been there for two Sundays now that I've seen him there. And he's standing there like this, just leaning on the side of the road, desperate. Doesn't know what to do with himself. He's low class. He's been rejected. Who's going to help him? You know, I said to Linda, well, let's look. I was quickly trying to find some money so that I don't normally carry cash. I was trying to find some money in my car, but unfortunately the robots changed. Sorry, I should say traffic light changed. And we had to move. You see, those are the people we should be talking to, having conversations with. And then the second thing is we need to find harmony. We need to find what clicks and what makes us, yes, it's fantastic. You know, when you come and worship and you sing these songs that we've sung today, you know, they make our hearts warm because there is harmony. We're together. Our hearts are warm from the worship together. Romans 12 verse 16 Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of a low position. Do not be conceited. Amazing words from Paul there, that we live in harmony. And also in Psalm 133, which we all know very well, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful. But you know what? We, as we all have our own interpretations and our own ways of thinking, we, it's inevitable that we are going to disagree about something. You know, you, you will sit around a, a passage of Scripture and somebody will argue this point and somebody will argue that point. Because that's how they perceive or understand that passage of Scripture. What do you do? You beat them into silence with verbal abuse? Dominate them? No. You agree to disagree. You agree to disagree. You just say to them, in love, we do not agree, but I still love you as my brother or sister. Look at Paul and Barnabas. What happened to them? Interesting. If you turn to jump a bit forward to Acts 15, I'm going to read there for you. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement. Listen to these words. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. What did they do? They agreed to disagree. And they went their way. And you know what? Them separating, they continued. The work continued to multiply. Paul continued to do the ministry. John Mark went on to write the scriptures. Barnabas continued to encourage. They didn't stop. You know, oh, you know, <laughs> did you hear what he said? I'm not going with you. No. They carried on. They agreed to disagree. The next thing I also need to note about these men here in the church of Antioch is that they had no, no control issues. They were not trying to control the situation. Because what did they do? They were praying. They were fasting. They were waiting on the Lord. They were worshipping. And guess what? When you do that, God speaks. 
No, <clears throat> excuse me. I have for many years, many years, struggled with prayer meetings. Not because I don't want to be praying, but because I find them is that we get to the prayer meeting and we say, right, Lord, are you listening? <coughs> Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. You got that? Thank you. Answer all of them. Goodbye. We have a shopping list. It's all good once. He wants a conversation. You speak, he speaks. That's prayer. My students back in Zimbabwe, I taught them how to have a prayer that is a conversation with God. And we would have a day of prayer and fasting. And so we would come together and we would be worshipping. And when we felt the time was right, we would go and we would start to pray. And I would say to the students, I want you to sit in silence and hear what God is saying to you. And then you tell me what that verse of scripture is. And I wrote it on a whiteboard beyond in, the, in the lecture class. Well, we would sit the whole morning and this one would pipe up that scripture. That one would pipe up that scripture. That one would pipe up that scripture. By the end of the morning, we had a board full of scripture verses. And then I would go and stand at the back of the hall and I would look at that board and I would say, Lord, what is the common theme on that board? I can promise you, every single time God spoke. Every single time. He was saying the same thing to everybody in that prayer room from different passages of Scripture. And then we knew what God wanted, wanted us to do because it was on the board. Now some verses were slightly off because, you know, that happens. But the most of them were bang on target. And you know what? That is how God told us, a little small team, that we should mobilize the nation of Zimbabwe for a national day of prayer. That's how he told us. We didn't suck it out of our thumb. We did it like this. And so our prayer meetings were like this. Every month when we would have our prayer meeting, we would do this. And so here are, guess what? These men, diverse, together, Praying, worshipping, fasting. And guess what happened? God spoke. You look at it again. It says in verse 2, While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. See, that's when God speaks. When we're together, worshipping, fasting, praying, looking at the scriptures, getting all the saints together, saying, what is God saying? Writing it down on the board. Oh, let's check if there's a common theme here. Yes! Because the Holy Spirit is speaking. And He's speaking through the individuals. Using their flavor, their diversity to speak to the situation. And so, all of us should be doing that when we want to hear what God is saying. This is what we should be doing. Like this church in Acts. Together, in our diversity. You see, remember Jesus said that if we want to be great, and he's talking to us now who think that we should control things, that we should take order, 
that we should take charge. He says to us, uh uh-uh. No, no, no. Sit down. This is what he did in Mark 9.35. He said, sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be uh, first must be the last and the servant of all. You see, God has called us also to serve, not to lord it over others. It doesn't happen in God's kingdom. He calls us to serve. Philippians 2, just to continue with this theme of serving. Therefore, if you have any, sorry, Philippians 2 from 1 to 4. Therefore, if if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing of the Spirit or in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and of one mind, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And that's what we need to be doing. For the church to be like the church in Antioch, to be this diverse church which lives in unity and in harmony, that's what we should be doing, serving one another. Galatians 5 and verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Yes. Do not, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. I had a great friend of mine. Well, he is a great friend now. <laughs> a guy called Chris. And I was in Harare where we had our team, our main office. And Chris was out in a small town, town called Banquet. And he was in charge of my training program. And so Chris would be running with the program, and every now and again I would go and see him, and we would talk, and you know, we would discuss the program. Now, Chris, by the way, came from the UK. He was ex-Navy. He was a big guy. He was about this tall. You know, when he looks at you, he's looking down at you like this, you know. Oh, that's how we say it. He was a big guy. And one day, out of the blue, I get an email. You are a control freak. <gasps> what? What are you talking about? He says, you're a control freak. I thought, oh, well, Lord, here we go. Now, obviously, listen to this culture clash. My dear brother from the UK, you talk about things, everybody has the opinion, you know, etc., etc. I come from my Afrikaans culture, we are autocratic. You know, we prefer to tell you what to do. And so I was telling him what to do, and he was going, I don't like that. So therefore, you are control freak. And he wrote an email to our head office here in the UK. So my head office in the UK writes an email back to me. Yo, I tell you what, day. Huh. I thought, what am I going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to drive out there. I'm going to tell him off. I'm going to tell him to get these bags and go back to England. I don't want you in Zimbabwe. And my truck and off I go. I get halfway phone call. Brother, another brother of mine, also called Chris. <laughs> He's a lovely brother. But he was Afrikaner. He says, Mike, what you doing? I said, no, I'm going to go and sort Chris out. You know. He says, Mike, no. Humble yourself. Repent. Apologize. Say sorry. 
You know what it's like when you're standing there, you know, your face is burning with anger, and all you can think of is getting rid of this guy. And your friend says to you, repent and humble yourself. You think I felt good? No, not at all, not, not for a second. But I stood there, and I stood, and I, <laughs> I just stood. I don't know what passes by, I thought there's this crazy man standing in the air by his vehicle going, uh. I got back in the car, started driving. By the time I reached Banket, which is about 50 kilometers, God had broken my heart. I walked into the training center, and Chris knew I was coming because I'd phoned him saying, I'm coming to see you. <laughs> you know what God had been doing? He'd been speaking to both of us. As I walked into this flat, I said, hi. And as I said, hi, Chris, this guy, this big guy comes up and, <laughs> my goodness me, and knocked the wind out of me. I was, <gasps> he says, Mike, I'm sorry. And I said, Chris, I'm sorry. You see, when we're willing to humble ourselves, God works. He loves you. He's going to help you. He's going to work with the other person. They may ignore you the first time, or the second, or the third, or even the hundredth time. But Jesus says 77 times 7, turn the other cheek. God is fighting for you. We are, don't have to fight for ourselves. But then, lastly, this is number five. They were a launching church. And I've got to go quickly. Look at Acts 13, verse 2 and 3. I want to read it again. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now, I know it is a summary here. You know, Luke is just writing a detail of the event. There was obviously a lot more to this that happened. They must have prayed about where does God want us to go, how are we going to go, etc., etc., but that is not recorded here. But anyway, the church of Antioch then goes on to send these two men on three missionary journeys to which you and I, can trace Christian roots to those missionary journeys. And wherever they went, they shared and preached the gospel and planted churches. You see, Antioch was the model that God wanted, not Jerusalem. You'd have thought he would have chosen Jerusalem, you know, surely. Uh -uh, he did not. God chose the church in Antioch. Diverse, multicultural. The church in Jerusalem, monocultural. Focusing on the Jews. And that church, which is multicultural, went ahead and sent the gospel to the Gentiles. And you and I today are here because of that church in Antioch. Because of what they did. And so, our question is, what are we doing? What are we doing about launching from here? How are we launching out to the nations? Right here, around us in London, we have all the nations. We don't have to find money to buy you airplane tickets and visas and etc. etc. and battle all the red tape and then you know pack your bag and your coffin on your back and send you to Africa. No. You can go right here in London. Right across on the other side of London, you'll find all the Somalis. All the Somalis are there. You'll struggle to do ministry in Somalia. People have been thrown out. 
persecuted. The church is struggling. But guess what? God has brought them to London. And so we as OM have got a team in North London. And we are reaching out to the Somalis. And I've got a friend in uh, uh, Kitwe, in Zambia. Guess what he's doing? Reaching out to Somalis. Two worlds apart. We can do it. And my question is today, what are we doing about launching out? You know, I often, one of the first things that I do when I walk into a church, I look to see, where is the missionary board? Where is the board that says that we have sent, you know, Joseph and Jack and Mary and Anne to the mission field? Where is that board? When are we praying for those missionaries? How can I send my gifts to the missionaries? The unfortunate trend that we have in the church today is this. The church wants to support missions. So you know what they do? They send their money to an organization. Is there a relationship there? No. There's no relationship. You don't know what that missionary is struggling with. You don't know what that missionary is battling on the missionary field. You know, we're not experts. I stand before you as a missionary sent from my church in Johannesburg. They have supported me for <coughs> more than 30 years. Every single month they have never missed a beat. They know all about me. They know about Linda. We are in their bulletin every week for prayer. They know about my daughter. They know about my autistic grandson. They know about my son and his struggles and his wife. They know all about it because they care about us. There's a relationship. And so once a year, I will go back to my home church. And I will speak to them. And they will embrace me and encourage me. When we arrive there, they give us little goodie bags. And it's full of the most amazing little things. I've still got quite a few of them with some stuff and others I haven't used. It's a love expression. We love you, Michael and Linda. You're our missionaries. We care about you. And so they send money every single month for our support. You see, I don't get paid by OM. I have to raise my money to pay myself. Does that make sense? And that's how it works. And then I go to other churches and there's nothing. No, we support uh, this organization or that organization. Let me pause here. I'm not speaking about you as a church because I don't know you. I'm speaking from my own experience. This is what I've seen in church after church after church. And you know what ends up? You send up this nice gift to the organization. You know what ends up? It gets gobbled up in admin fees. Gone. Now, OM have probably... One of the lowest, what they call the lowest gearings in, in missions, where we uh, right across, uh, take about 13% of all money that comes in to administer OM internationally. That's all, 13%. Every other penny ends up in the lap of the missionary because that's what is right. And so this church in Antioch, as they sent out Paul and Barnabas, they loved them. You know, Paul and Barnabas would come back to the church at Antioch. And they would tell them all about the ministry they've been involved in. They would tell them all the stories and all the churches that they've planted. And the church at Antioch would be going, yes, yes, yes. They're so excited. At last, look at what God is doing. And they were so excited, they said to Paul and Barnabas, why are you waiting? Get out there, do another journey. And off they would go again 
on another missionary journey. They were engaged. They were launching into the mission field. We owe the church in Antioch for what we have today. If they didn't launch out, if they didn't send out Paul again and again and again on his missionary journeys, we probably wouldn't be here. Although God would have made another plan, I'm sure. You hear what I'm, you hear what I'm saying, saints? We need to be a church like Antioch. Five things that I've gone through about the church in Antioch. And I'm going to quickly repeat them. They were a laboring church. They worked hard to get together, travel distances, coming together as a church in Antioch. They were a leading church. They were a learning church. They were a loving church. And they were a launching church. And my prayer is that we, all of us as individuals, would be wanting to be involved in that process so that we can be doing just like the church in Antioch and impact and change the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because right now, outside these doors of this church, Wherever you are on Zoom or on YouTube, it doesn't matter. Outside your door, there are people waiting to hear the gospel, maybe even for the first time. A friend of mine who have been, uh, tr we were training together at an international uh, training course. And uh, we were talking about, right, we're here to, you know, train and we're going to go and do some evangelism. We're going to go and talk to people. And uh, we're going to go down this road, oh, down up there, around the corner, so far away. And we stepped out the door and right on our doorstep was somebody we could speak to about the gospel. We don't have to go far. We don't have to go far. But we need God, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit. I was working in a coffee bar. I'll close with a story. I was working in a coffee bar in Pretoria, and a friend of mine who always go out in pairs. We're out to the local cinema place where the, you know, the restaurants and the cinemas are. And uh, we were training to do evangelism. And our instructor told us, okay, now what you do, they taught us the four spiritual laws. From, if you're not familiar with it, you can look it up on the Campus Crusade. And they taught us how to use the four spiritual laws when you first meet a person, how to engage them in a conversation, and how to lead them, and Lord willing to, to get them to make a decision to follow Jesus. That was the four spiritual laws. And uh, so we were all given these, and so we would go to this, this place. And so my friend and I were standing there, and I were as nervous as two little babies. Our knees are shaking and having a conversation. We are so scared. You know, there's no such thing as this. it's natural. It's not. It's, you've got to work at it. You've got to overcome fear. Anyway, we prayed. And um, we decided, right, the first person that comes along, we're going to challenge him. Right, okay, good. So along comes this lady. She stops. And we say, hi, how are you, all the pleasantries. And we start to share about the four spiritual laws. And I could see she was hesitant. She was hesitating. And I said, you know what? I got on my knees and middle of this place and I said, I want you to seriously, seriously consider what Jesus has done for you because he loves you and he wants you to know him. 
Well, that conversation carried on a little bit. She did pray the sinner's prayer. We gave her material and she left. But that's not the main story. Across the atrium on the other side was a man that was watching us. And he'd been watching us for quite a while. So we all went now, finished, and you know, the, mo the cinemas and movies had finished and everybody left and went home. And so we decided, well, let's go back to the coffee bar. We get back to the coffee bar. We all, yep, 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 yep. We were all telling our stories of how exciting it was. Knock on the door. Hello, how can we help you? He says, there's those two men there. I want to talk to them. Phew. Now he's scared. Why do they want to talk to us? And we welcomed the guy in and we said, come in, have some coffee. Now we're talking about like 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. in the morning. And he says, I want to talk to you too. He said, I was watching you. I have never seen somebody so passionate about Jesus that they would kneel in front of somebody and ask them to listen to the gospel. He says, I've come now to accept Jesus as my Savior. But first I want to tell you something. I am a priest of the third eye, which is a satanic order. In other words, he was a, he was a priest of the satanic church. Because of what we did, he was willing to accept Jesus. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we never know what's around the corner. We never know what's going to happen in the next five minutes, the next day, next year, next ten years. All we have is what is in front of us. And so, Lord, my prayer is that every one of us would be like this church in Antioch, united in their diversity, busy with praying and fasting and worshiping. And in that, you sent forth Paul and Barnabas to the work to which you called them, to open the world to the gospel. Lord, have mercy on us. For those of us that have been fearful, have failed, have been unsure, have mercy. Help us. Give us courage. Because it's your Holy Spirit that does that for us. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time together today. Will you now water the seed of your word? Because I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.